Okay. What what does this do? It's a cursor. Mouse up. This is a back and forward. Ah. You can see here also. Okay. I am thankful to the organizers of this seminar for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present before you some of my ideas on education and the state of education at present in which spirituality has been largely ignored. If we look at our present vision of education, if we go and ask the principal of a school or college or the vice chancellor of a university, what is your aim in setting up this institute? What kind of human being do you want to produce out of this whole structure? I imagine they would say, our aim is to produce <coughs> a hard-working, disciplined, intelligent worker in his own field of specialization, who will also hopefully be a leader of men in that field. I want to point out to you that all these qualities were present in Adolf Hitler, whom many people regard as one of the most evil personages of the 20th century. He was hardworking, he was disciplined, he was a leader of men. He was intelligent and professional at his work. So all these qualities were there, which we are trying at present to produce through education. So what guarantee is there that when we are imparting knowledge, empowering a human being, because that knowledge enables him to function more efficiently, more intelligently, to earn more money and have greater ability, all of which ultimately means greater power, then what guarantee is there that this power will be used benevolently, constructively or whether it will be used for destruction? The only thing that Hitler lacked was love and compassion. So what is there in our present day education to ensure that the human being who comes out of our system will come out with love and compassion? Unfortunately, in the present paradigm of education, we have taken it only as a responsibility to impart knowledge and we have ignored wisdom. But knowledge without wisdom is dangerous because knowledge can be used destructively and knowledge can be used constructively. Any form of power, whether it is muscle power, electrical power or nuclear power, can it be used for destruction or it can be used constructively? So when we impart knowledge, is it not also our responsibility to impart along with it the wisdom to employ that power wisely, rightly in society? Unfortunately, we have ignored that aspect in education. And this lopsided development of the human mind is responsible for most of the problems that we are facing in society today, in modern society today. We have people who are very knowledgeable, 
very expert at their own particular work, but they have very little understanding of themselves or of life, because that has not been taken to be an aim in education. My first slide talks about this role of education. I have said here that the problems of our society are not due to a lack of education, but due to the kind of education we are imparting. It has been caused by the highly educated MSc, LLB, PhDs, not by the uneducated man. We may think that it is the illiteracy, the problem in the world is illiteracy, but if you examine it, it is not the illiterate villager in India or Argentina or any other Africa who is responsible for the present state of our society. It is the highly educated people who become ministers or diplomats or army men or scientists who are responsible for the entire machinery of war, for the laws, for producing bombs and so on. So, I want to correct this impression that the problem of the world is the uneducated man, which does not mean that the uneducated man should not be educated. It just means that the kind of education we are imparting today is no barrier to barbarity. So that's what I say here. Present day education is no barrier to barbarity. Indeed, the Holocaust was perpetrated by highly educated people and it occurred in a country which had the best of art, the best of music, the best of science and literature. Everything that we are trying to produce through education, Germany already had. And yet, one of the most dastardly crimes of the century took place in that culture. It is important for us to recognize this fact and see that education does not create a recurrence of that. When we impart knowledge, we must also impart the wisdom or outlook to employ it rightly, responsibly. There is danger in concentrating only on specialization. And therefore, there needs to be an awareness of more holistic education. Understanding oneself is more important than understanding the world. At present, we are concentrating on making them understand history, geography, sciences, how they, about the, all about the external world. But very little understanding of violence or desire or my relationship with pleasure, or indeed what exactly is love and what constitutes healthy relationship. Humility, inquiry and understanding are more important than arrogance, belief and power. We need to create a mind that is scientific and religious, humane at the same time. By religious, I don't mean belief, I mean spiritual. The final test of any education, if you really want to evaluate what is the quality of that education, is to ask ourselves, are our graduates better planetary citizens? Planetary citizens, not just your country's nationals. Will they lead to a happier future for the planet as a whole? I have, on the next slide, <coughs> put a letter that was written by a survivor of the Holocaust who came from Spain. He wrote in 1972, Dear teacher, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians. 
Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and children shot and burnt by high school and college graduates. So, I am suspicious of education. My request is that teachers help students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more human. A very poignant letter, very true, but I'm afraid we have ignored this advice in education. Here is what Krishnamurti has to say about education, because I feel that our very vision of what we want to achieve through education is defective. Education may have a different meaning altogether, not merely transferring what is printed on a page to your brain. Education may mean opening the doors of perception to the vast movement of life. It may mean learning how to live happily, freely, not in hate and confusion, but in beatitude. Modern education is blinding us. We learn to fight each other. Right education is surely letting the mind free from its conditioning. Perhaps then there can be love which in its action will bring about true relationship between man and man. Now, what is it that one can do <coughs> if one is to bring about this change in education? If one realizes that globally, all over the world, this is not just the problem of India. Everywhere, education suffers from this because we have excluded the need for wisdom. And knowledge does not lead to wisdom. I once read a small poem which emphasizes this point, the difference between knowledge and wisdom. It says, Knowledge and wisdom, far from being one, oft times have no connection. Knowledge dwells, dwells in minds replete with the thoughts of others. Wisdom in those attentive to their own. Knowledge is proud that it knows so much. Wisdom is humble that it knows no more. So if we want education to ensure that we are not producing more Mussolini's and Stalin's and Hitler's in the world, we need to take responsibility both for inculcating knowledge which we are doing at present and at the same time inculcating wisdom, helping the student to come upon wisdom which is spirituality. To me spirituality is not psychic phenomena or miracles and things like that. To me it is this quest for wisdom and wisdom is non-denominational. There is no such thing as Christian wisdom and Hindu wisdom and Jain wisdom. Uh, for all human beings, wisdom is the same thing, to free the mind of its illusions so that one lives with not prejudices but with the truths and facts. So it is the same as quest for truth. If one considers <coughs> what is the reason for all the evil in the world, you will see that you can trace it back to the ego process in our consciousness. Ego meaning that somewhere I am only committed to furthering my own self-interest. That my may include also my family, my town, my religion, my country. But it's still only wanting the welfare and the good of me 
and the mind with whom I have identified. That is the ego state, which is basically being selfish. On the next slide, I have shown why I think that the ego is the central problem. Take anything that naturally exists, both in our consciousness and outside, add the ego to it and see what it becomes. If you take love, add the ego to it, it becomes attachment, possessiveness. Wishes, we all have wishes. Add the ego to it and it becomes desire and addiction. Power, which is the ability to do work. Add the ego to it and it becomes domination and exploitation. Sexuality, which is there in plants, it is there in animals, it is there in us, part of nature. Add the ego to it and it becomes lust and pornography and rape. Friendship. Add the ego to it and it becomes support and dependence. Humility, which we all regard as a virtue, add the ego to it and it becomes a feeling of inferiority, of being servile. Talent, which we all want to cultivate, add the ego to it and it turns into pride, vanity and a feeling of superiority, which is inequality and hierarchy. Excellence, add the ego to it and it becomes competition and rivalry. Groups, we all work in groups, whether we are in a school or a political party or in a country. Add the ego to it and it leads to division and nationalism. Thinking, which is common to all of us, add the ego to it and it turns into worry, fear and anxiety. Pleasure, which is so natural. Add the ego to it and it turns into habit, addiction and boredom. Needs, we all have needs, add the ego to it and it turns into greed and covetousness. So, there is no problem with the first column on the left. All the problems come by from the ad addition of the ego process to it. Therefore, it is important in education to ensure that the resultant product graduate which comes out of the educational system is not egotistic. Now this means I must not use as motivation in education any methods that will strengthen the ego. It means you must not use reward and punishment. You must not encourage competition because you are teaching him that his fellow classmate is not a friend and a brother, but is his rival, that he is in some kind of a race with him, that promotes the ego in the person, individuality. So it has, if you have this vision, that I want to produce a man who is not only efficient and knowledgeable, but I want to also have a person who is not egotistic, not self-centered, not selfish, then it has consequences for the vision of education. So I have tried to draw up the elements of a new vision of education which would enable this to happen. Now it is that vision which dictates everything. What is your vision in education dictates what kind of campus you will have, what kind of teachers you will have, what courses you will have, how much time you will give for games and sports and body development, how much for intellect, how much for spiritual understanding, how much for relationship with nature, everything is included in holistic education. So I have the next slide on a new vision of education. First of all, I think we need to create a global mind and not a nationalistic or parochial mind. One which feels one with the whole of the world and humanity. We have talked about brotherhood of human beings in, in Hinduism and Buddhism and so on. It has been talked about Sarvade, uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. 
but it has never become a reality it has always been only a concept and it is important to distinguish between concepts and reality you may say love your neighbor it has been said 2000 years ago or more love your neighbor but that has not become a fact it is only remained an idea so the idea and the fact are different things it is very easy to deal with ideas but it is what actually is reality is the fact of what is so can i can we educate in such a way that the human being feels he is one part of one world one humanity so that there is no emphasis on national division or religious division and so on emphasize human development and not economic at present whether you like it or not education is set up according to a factory model you mainly consider the raw material is the child coming in at age 6 and the product is what comes out at the age of 22 after 15 or 16 years you process that raw material and out comes a doctor and an engineer and an artist and they perform the work that we want to be performed in society you are not in he is happy or not whether he'll be a creative human being whether his marriage will break down or not is not the concern at all in education so we are merely using them as we look upon students as util, utilitarian point of view how will we utilize them for performing the work in society and that's exactly the factory model we have to look at it differently the whole vision needs to be different education should be concerned with that human being not with the economy value goodness about efficiency because efficiency without goodness has no value encourage inquiry not conformity and obedience the greatest human beings have been those who have dissented from the past jesus christ dissented from the jews galileo dissented from aristotle's views for to, which were held for 2000 years the buddha dissented from the hindus and that's what brought about change that's what brought about something new but if you have only people conforming obeying then you will never create anything new and therefore there has to be this respect for dissent which means you must encourage throughout education inquiry not only we encourage it at present in science but i am afraid in religion or in social this thing we don't encourage inquiry cultivate cooperation not competition because team work is more important than individual achievement if you want to do anything in this world you will have to work along with other human beings you can't just do it singly and the ability to work together with others means friendliness cooperation mutual respect all that that spirit and unless we create that spirit which is destroyed if you promote competition and rivalry we promote competition because we are so concerned with the achievement but really question it is it terribly important which human being jumps half a millimeter more than all other human beings and therefore you have a big prize attached to it and you have this olympic games all of that our mind accepts all that as inevitable but is it really important or should, are we asking a wrong question we should be asking are do they enjoy their jumping is more important than whether somebody jumps half a millimeter more and just because an indian jumps half a millimeter more why do i feel proud what did i do to make him jump half a millimeter more so all these are psychological illusions that the mind creates out of feeling of nationalism and so on which means the spirit of democracy is more important than that of domination the fifth i have put create a learning mind and not an acquisitive mind just as acquiring 
physical property which Professor Jain talked about. Hmm? You, you need to have limits to it, have austerity. There is also mental property as knowledge. That is also property. That's not what I am. The professor of Buddhist philosophy or Jain philosophy has, knows everything that Jainism said and Mahavira said, but he doesn't live with the consciousness of Mahavira. He's just like any other man. So the knowledge does not transform consciousness. You can learn Buddhist philosophy, but that will not make you the Buddha. So how does education must concern itself with actual transformation of consciousness, which is what is self-knowledge and virtue, which is true spirituality. So awakening of intelligence is more important than cultivation of memory. So I have put the sixth one. Create a mind that is both scientific and religious at the same time. By religion I don't mean belief. By religion I mean spirituality. Which means understanding the world and understanding ourselves. Being rational and at the same time compassionate. Having respect for all life. Being a friend to nature and not looking upon nature as a resource for economic progress, aware of the limitations of knowledge. And seventh, I have put in the art of living. Education must give us a high quality of life. Now your quality of life is not just by the money you earn or the car you drive and so on. If you are worried, if you are anxious, if you don't sleep properly, also it affects your quality of life. So the quality of mind is more important than the quality of physical life. Inwardly flowering in goodness. Working with joy rather than working for rewards. Perceiving beauty is more important than pursuit of pleasure. Which means sensitivity is more important than ambition. And lastly, I have put a holistic development of all, all our faculties and not merely specialization in one direction. Because I may be a scientist, but I am first a human being. So I must learn the art of living first and then specialize in science. Otherwise, it goes wrong. So I feel that if we had this vision of education, in our mind, we would set up our education very differently from what it is now. And because we have not done that, we have produced human beings who are intellectual, who are technicians, but who are not wise. And this combination, this lopsided development of having excess of knowledge and very little wisdom is responsible for our uh, present state of society when you look at the causes deeply. Thank you.